Adam Greer, he's an assistant research professor in the Division of Marine Science at the University of Southern Mississippi here, working for the Concord Consortium. Um, his research interest include zooplankton and larval fish ecology, planktonic web food webs, plankton patch dynamics, and biological sampling technology, particularly imaging systems and acoustics. And he's going to go ahead and share his recent research with us. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks everyone for being here today, and thanks to Monica and all the organizers for inviting me. Um, it's an honor to be here. Um, I'm going to be talking about this system that you see on the screen that I've actually been working with for about 10 years now. Time flies. Um, and uh, all these different uh, images you see here were taken with this system in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and in particular, I'm interested in um, plankton and how they may interact with oil. So just to get everyone on the same page, um, as you all know, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill happened about eight years ago, 11 lives were lost. Um, it was a huge uh, chaotic scene at the surface. And what Guillaume just went over, um, you can kind of see in that picture on the left side there, how immediately after the spill, the ocean currents were taking over, uh, aggregating the oil at the surface, moving it around. Um, and this was further complicated by the application of dispersants at the surface as well. And so this is a big hot topic of research is just understanding where the oil went and how it changed with uh, the dispersants and other things going on in the area. Below the surface, um, the situation is also very complicated. We had uh, dispersants being applied directly at the wellhead. And then a pretty well described um, deep water plume at about 1,100 meters um, where you had trapped oil and gas. Um, and this figure is showing uh, kind of these little particles raining out. This is uh, the marine oil snow that took uh, material from that uh, trapped plume and exported it back into the sediments. And about half of the oil made it to the surface. Um, where we saw a lot of the immediate environmental effects, um, dead seabirds, whales, very um, obvious environmental problems um, to us. But one of the big questions was how some of these smaller, more abundant animals were being affected by this oil. Um, and you know, these are very important parts of the food web, but it's a lot harder to see the effects and understand how they're going to propagate throughout the ecosystem. And so that's really what I'm going to talk about today are these uh, planktonic animals and um, how we're using this new technology to understand um, what happens under normal circumstances so we can better understand what would happen in an oil spill uh, scenario. So what is plankton? Um, one of the kind of th gives you a key or an idea of how it lives is the word plankton which comes from this Greek word meaning uh, wanderer or drifter. So these are animals or plants or plant cells uh, that cannot uh, swim against the prevailing currents. So they are at the mercy of the currents. There's a bit of ability to migrate vertically, but they cannot swim against uh, your average current in the ocean. Three groups, we have the phytoplankton. Um, these are kind of the powerhouse of ocean life. They are taking carbon dioxide and converting it into usable compounds that all the other animals in the ocean rely on. In addition, as a waste product of this photosynthesis, uh, they produce oxygen. Approximately half the oxygen in our atmosphere is produced by phytoplankton. The zooplankton are all the animal plankton, um, and then they have this kind of catch-all category of marine snow, a very hot topic in a lot of the oil spill research um, that is essentially detrital, dead, or decaying material that sinks through the water column that has a uh, biological origin. So phytoplankton, here's an image of phytoplankton. You see these hair-like um, uh, essentially chains of phytoplankton cells. These are diatoms. It's one of the most important phytoplankton uh, globally. Uh, the zooplankton are divided up into two groups. You have meroplankton and holoplankton. So meroplankton spend a portion of their life cycle drifting in the currents, and then they eventually grow to a certain size where they become nectonic. They can actually swim or they settle in a benthic or bottom habitat. And this includes the larval stages of almost every fish imaginable other than sharks and rays. They have uh, tiny planktonic eggs that they spawn in the water column. Those hatch into larval uh, forms of various kinds. This is a pipefish. You can see that narrow thing. There's a tail on the top and a little snout on the bottom. Uh, you have a flatfish. This one on the uh, left middle is a lobster larva. Uh, the two on the bottom are different stages of crab larvae. And this uh, squid-like thing is actually a tube anemone larva. And so there's just a bunch of different larval forms that are out there 
all drifting around in the currents. The hollow plankton spend their entire lives as plankton. These include copepods on the far left top. Uh, those are one of the most important consumers globally. Um, these three on the these uh, three groups on the top half are consumers of phytoplankton, and the ones on the bottom are consuming other zooplankton. And the marine snow, these are essentially dead or decaying material, um, including exoskeleton, that's a shrimp exoskeleton you can see sinking through. Um, and so there are really a lot of different forms. Uh, the plankton are actually quite beautiful, as you can see, um, but scientifically they're interesting because they're this critical link in the food web. Um, and not much is known, especially in the Gulf, about uh, different processes and why uh, certain groups show up where at different times. Um, in addition, like I mentioned earlier, the early life stage of many marine animals um, are meroplankton, and so we have to understand some of the oceanographic processes so we can better understand population changes um, through all, for all these different fish species. They're also, um, because they have really fast generation times, they're essentially a canary in the coal mine. They can tell us that bi they have a biological indicator of any stress on the ecosystem because they can rapidly die off, they can rapidly respond and grow faster um, for, uh, in, under different ocean conditions. And marine snow is this uh, hot topic in the oil spill science because it can export um, carbon, so it's part of this biological pump in the ocean, but it can also entrain other materials such as oil um, and pollutants and then move that around. So one way that we can look at the distribution of plankton is with satellites, which we uh, mentioned earlier. Brooke's going to talk more about remote sensing. Um, but so in this image here is a map of the northern Gulf of Mexico and the warmer colors uh, essentially indicate that there are more phytoplankton in that area near the surface and the cooler colors um, indicate lower abundance. And so if you look at where Deepwater Horizon was, it was well offshore in deep water, not a whole lot of life out there um, relative to the coast. Not that and I don't want to say that there's nothing out there that's of interest because there's certainly many important habitats, deep water habitats that are virtually under, really understudy, we just don't know a whole lot about them. But if you want um, a concentration of life, the coastal area is where there are a, there's a lot of uh, fisheries, there's a lot of plankton, it's just where life tends to aggregate. And so when we want to think about oil spill impacts, certainly what happened at the site is important, but it's also important to know what's happening on these, co how the oil is getting to these coastal areas and what's happening once it's there. And so as part of my work, I'm uh, in the Concord Consortium, which is studying this nearshore habitat, um, which is a critical area for fisheries. And also some, there's a lot of freshwater input in this area, such as river plumes, um, there are fronts and these very ephemeral features that show up that are very important for aggregating plankton and also oil. And so plankton ecology, in my view, it kind of links these two topics because you have organisms that are being dispersed by uh, the prevailing currents, but then it's also this critical link to fisheries. And so it's a really interesting topic um, that technology is helping us understand quite a bit. So to understand the importance of this new technology, it's important to kind of take a step back and understand how we sampled plankton in the past. And what we still do today, actually, um, is use this uh, technique called a bongo net, which is essentially a net that we just tow vertically through the water column, and you get one big sample. But the problem is you have no idea where in the water column that sample came from. So if you were to want to understand the exposure rates of different plankton, you want to know if they're at the top of the water or the bottom based on where the oil is. Um, and so people realized that this was a, a problem, that you're just averaging across the entire water column. And so they developed these multiple opening and closing nets that allow you to get uh, vertical bins where you have different samples in different parts of the water column. Um, but you're still limited because you can't really open them every meter, say if you have a, a freshwater plume that's very small scale. Uh, you can't really capture a lot of the biological variability around that feature. There's also some really severe biases with these net systems uh, for organism detection. So anything that's slightly fragile, that doesn't have a hard exoskeleton like a shrimp or a copepod, uh, is going to get destroyed because it gets pinned up against the mesh and just gets obliterated essentially. So all these gelatinous organisms that we know are very important because there's a ton out there just aren't quantitatively described with a lot of these systems. And so with the advent of 
more computing power in the 1990s, we started to see kind of an explosion of different optical systems that were developed, um, including some at Woods Hole. The video plankton recorder on the left is, uh, was developed at Woods Hole. Um, and this also, also the one on the right was developed at Woods Hole. And then there's the one in the middle is um, pretty popular in Europe still, uh, underwater video profiler. And so the, these, all these systems, they have different optical techniques. They're all sampling at a very high resolution, so you get really good vertical resolution of where different plankton are aggregating and things like that. There's also this potential that's a really hot research topic is trying to take the image data and automatically process it and get biological information much faster than we do with traditional net-based uh, sampling. Um, so, and there are also fewer biases among different organisms. The real difference between the systems are the volume that they sample, and so if you're after some rarer plankton, you generally have to sample a larger volume. Uh, so, so the video plankton recorder, for example, measures a pretty small volume. It's great for looking at copepod abundances because they're very abundant. Um, but uh, the system I'm gonna talk about today is the in situ ichthyoplankton imaging system, which falls under the um, large volume uh, category. And so we call this thing actually the ISIS, um, which I, people invented, talked about that name before ISIS was a terrorist group, so I don't want to change it because then they win, so. Um, we have, so the way it works, so this is the system right here, and so the bottom two pods are where the imaging happens, um, and this, this view, it's like an overhead view of those two pods in the bottom. So you have an LED going through a pinhole, and it hits a plano convex lens, and then a mirror, and it gets projected across this area, which is where the water is, the imaged water parcel, hits another mirror, and then goes into a camera. And so what happens is that whenever there are plankton or particles in this area, they actually block the light source, and so we image them as shadows. And this is called shadow graph imaging. Uh, the advantage of it is that when you backlight something, uh, you have a large depth of field, so anything in this imaged water parcel stays in focus, and so you can image a relatively large volume of water. Um, so we use a line scan camera, which is good for towing, um, and then uh, it has motor actuated wings that you can see on the side here. These actually, um, we have uh, software on board that allows us to change the angle of the wings, and so you can allow the vehicle to dive up and down through the water column while taking images. Um, and we, we collect a lot of data, about two terabytes of images collected uh, every 3.5 hours of towing. And so this is just kind of how it looks when we tow it behind a ship. Um, it's on a tether that basically beams up a bunch of uh, image data along with salinity, temperature, depth, spirometry, um, a proxy for phytoplankton abundance, um, dissolved oxygen. Um, and so we get this, this massive data set, a, a bunch of files that are images and a bunch of um, physical data, we call it, and we can merge those based off a common timestamp. So we get an environmental environmental information about every image that we take. And so for the Concord Consortium, we actually sampled with this system along these three uh, pink transects. Uh, you can see that this, so we're, we're confined to the coast um, and we uh, were essentially trying to describe the distribution of these uh, different plankton groups uh, amongst three different seasons. So what did we want to get out of this technology? Uh, we want to look at the physical structure essentially the temperature distribution, salinity, all those things detect uh, different features that may aggregate plankton or affect their distribution, such as fronts, eddies. Uh, these are all very important for biological productivity in the ocean. Um, and couple these with a uh, known current structure. And then we get biological structure. Um, we can look at a lot of different information from the images. And the key thing is that your physical data and your biological data are on the exact same scale, so you know uh, you, it's a really good instrument for looking at how the physical environment is structuring um, some of the abundances of different plankton. And so this is relevant to ocean ecology just in general because we don't know much about the distributions of plankton on fine scales and um, it allows us to kind of get an understanding of if there were hypothetically an oil spill, which groups would be most exposed, what would be the rate of exposure. And so the data kind of look like this. Um, I'm just gonna kind of orient you to this graph. Uh, the y-axis is depth and the x-axis is longitude, or sorry, latitude. Um, the color is the salinity of the uh, ocean in that particular area. 
and the size of these rings corresponds to the abundance of these two different groups. So the larger the ring, the more uh, plankton there are of that particular group. Um, these are in uh, individuals per meter cubed. And so these are two gelatinous organisms that have dramatically different uh, distributions. You have uh, uh, doliolid, which is a phytoplankton grazer. It's consuming phytoplankton, aggregating along the uh, picnic line here, or the halocline, and then a lot of it underneath. And then this is a tenophore, which is consuming copepods, and it tends to be in the top part of the water column, especially in these two areas of kind of intermediate salinity um, values. And so you can imagine if there were an oil spill, the exposure rates between these two groups would be dramatically different um, depending on where that oil was. And so one of the topics that I've been researching for quite a while um, are plankton thin layers, which are uh, dense aggregations of plankton, usually several times the background concentration where they just essentially aggregate in an area less than uh, five meters vertically. And there, basically nothing is studied about these in the Gulf of Mexico, however, there are other environments where they're very well described. Um, the ecological significance of thin layers is that they provide kind of this concentrated feeding zone. So you can imagine two scenarios here that I've outlined where you have a jellyfish predator and then a bunch of copepods that it's eating. Um, in the two situations, you have one where random distribution and one where they're aggregated in this thin layer. And so the predator can exploit the prey resources much more rapidly when they're aggregated in that thin layer. And so they're kind of this trope, they consider these a, a hot spot of a lot of uh, activity um, when you see these layers in different systems. And then of course, um, if these layers are very prevalent, it can affect how we understand um, exposure rates of oil. And so this uh, is gonna give you, I'm gonna show a video of one of these uh, toes up through the thin layer. And so this is an image, essentially this is kind of what you would see if you were on the ship looking at a live feed. And so a lot of these little hair-like things are diatoms. Some of the smaller dots are copepods. Um, the green dot is here, and it's going to move across the screen. It's going to show you exactly where you are in relation to that layer. Um, this graph is showing, the top graph is showing chlorophyll A, which is a proxy for phytoplankton abundance. And you'll see that it's um, very accurately representing what's in the screen. Um, and then we have salinity and uh, temperature on these two graphs. And so I'll just play it. And so you can see just how dramatically the environment changes as you go up into this layer. You'll start to see these um, really thick diatom chains showing up. And then there's a lot of these barrel-like organisms that are um, doliolids and that are phytoplankton grazers that are aggregating in that layer as well. And so it's very brief, but it's a just massive aggregation of plankton uh, within a very confined area. And then as we get further above, you see the uh, water columns start to clear out a bit, but still pretty abundant on the doliolids. And so that was detected um, in the uh, western side of our sampling area, um, kind of towards the 25 meter isobath or so. It's a pretty dramatic feature. I've actually never, I've looked done a lot of, seen a lot of thin layers in different environments, never seen one quite that dense and that confined to such a small space. And so if we look at the abundance of the different plankton around this thin layer, um, so this graph is showing the chlorophyll A, which is the color. Um, so the red is where the thin layer is, essentially the lighter or the hot, warmer colors. Um, and you can see these are ketidnas, which are arrowworms and shrimp. And so ketidnas tend to be aggregating at the surface and also right after the layer in similar pattern to the uh, shrimps. Uh, but then when we look at uh, hydromedusae, which I show here, they have a quite a different distribution where they're actually deeper in the water column and confined to the, um, so the, the left side of, your, of the graph is towards the north and the right side is to the south. So they're just north of the thin layer um, and then they kind of get, uh, become less abundant. And these are the doliolids, which you saw on the, in the video. Um, and this is the oxygen distribution. So you can see the thin layer, you have very high oxygen, which is not surprising because they're photosynthesizing, producing a lot of oxygen. And these grazers tend to follow the trajectory of the thin layer, but they're not really in the, in the most shallow part of the water column. So you can imagine um, just very different distributions for similarly sized organisms um, occupying these different um, areas of the water column. So just to take a take home message is that um, a lot of these imaging data can reveal some of these key relationships between the abundance of different groups and the oceanographic properties. It kind of sets the stage 
for um, these other questions about, so if you were uh, to able to simulate the distribution or uh, trajectory of oil, um, what is the biological setting that that oil is going to be propagated around through? Um, and uh, we, so we need this information to kind of understand uh, oil exposure rates in the Gulf of Mexico. And also kind of as another take home message, the, the ISIS data are really complex. And so an image is worth a thousand words, as they say. It's also very, it's hard to quantify exactly what you're seeing in these images. And this is kind of where um, there's a lot of research in artificial intelligence and things like that where um, you know, people are working on a lot of these fundamental problems about how, you know, you can say that this, uh, for example, this anemone larva is consuming a salp down here. How do you uh, automatically pull that information out of these images? And so it's kind of this, uh, um, and we've also, we wrote a paper recently about how a lot of these lobster larvae are attached to gelatinous zooplankton. And so there are these neat behavioral interactions that no one's ever seen before because we've been towing nets through the water for about 100 years. Um, there's also some interesting behaviors of the larvae where they curl up in a little ball. This is an eel larva that's all curled up and it's uh, hard to understand what's happening unless you've seen a lot of these images before. And this is a, a flatfish larva that's facing into the camera. And so there's just a, a lot, it's a hot research topic of um, how we can understand and get the most out of these images automatically. And so with that, um, I'll conclude and thank you for listening. <laughs>